Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Regional Chambers Teletown Hall series. We're happy. More importantly, we hope you, your family, and fellow team members are safe. Since the onset of this pandemic, we've continued the conversation about how business and state in the you know many of the new challenges of the pandemic. So today being our Constitution's 233rd birthday, um, I was tempted to go down the political road and talk about the, you know what some say questionable constitutionality of the issue. Or today, instead, we're instead of talking about any uh, constitutional interpretation, we're going to talk about how many businesses are working to handle the executive memorandum from the White House last month that gives the option to extend the due date of payroll taxes, which funds Social Security until next year. So with us today, uh, we have Michelle Kochmeyer from the Bodman Workplace Law Team um, to talk about whether implementing this deferral makes sense for your business. Uh, Bodman's been providing legal expertise to our region's top businesses for nearly a century back when your ancestors, I know mine for sure, worked to recover from our last pandemic. Uh, so Michelle, thanks for, for joining us. And we also have on the line Megan Spanitz, the Chamber's Vice President of Resource Development and Marketing, which really only describes a fraction of the work she does for the Chamber. Um, so Megan will be fielding questions after I'll turn it to Michelle. And Michelle, it's great to meet you through a screen. I believe it's Thursday in name only, um, but how are you and how is everyone at Bodman? Yeah, thanks, Matt, and thanks uh, for having me. Uh, this is an exciting opportunity for us at, at Bodman and and uh, I think a, a an interesting topic here today. So um, I'm good, thank you very much. Um, and to jump right in, uh, I think that this is a, a super interesting issue and I think, a, while well intended, we have a lot of unanswered questions even to this point. Um, so I, I think it probably makes sense for me to give a, a pretty high level overview of, of, of what this is all about. And then we can jump into specific questions because I think that that's where really the meat of these issues are, are coming in. Um, so generally, uh, President Trump issued a presidential memorandum um, giving a payroll tax holiday is what we're calling it. It's a holiday because it's not promised to be forgiven. It, it defers the 6.2% of the employee's portion of the Social Security tax. Um, the only eligible employees are making 104000 um, a year and less than four grand per biweekly pay period. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the nuances with respect to that is that um, an employee who may, may be hourly or an employee whose wages vary from paycheck to paycheck may be eligible for this deferral on some paychecks, but not others. So that's one of the nuances that was clarified um, by the later guidance issued by the IRS notice. Um, you know, there was a there was long anticipated guidance from the IRS. How are we going to handle this pres presidential memorandum? How are we going to implement it? And so finally, they came out about I think three days before we were set to implement this and gave us a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> um, so we, we do know some things and, and, and some things are, are, are left a, a mystery. One of those things is um, initially it was whether it was optional. It is now um, been clarified that this is an optional program for employers to implement. Um, on the other hand, federally, um, the federal government is is fully implementing this program and employees do not have the option to opt out of it. So that's an interesting piece uh, of this puzzle. Um, the other interesting piece, which I suspect most of the questions will relate to, what happens after the payroll period, uh, the deferral period is over? What happens come January 1? 
And that's where, uh, again, a lot of the questions are still left unanswered. Um, but what we do know is that at the moment, it's not forgiven. So potentially, um, employees are going to have to pay this back. How do you do that? Again, we don't have a lot of insight on that. It's been suggested that perhaps employers double withhold uh, for the period between January 1 and, and um, April 30th. And, and that sort of gets into, Matt, one of the reasons that I would say potentially employers um, should opt out of this or may opt out of this and why a lot of FedEx, CVS, um, Wells Fargo, the Postal Service are all opting out of this, not only related to the administrative burden that um, it, it just is going to simply take to implement this, but because I think it's going to end up being a, a, a significant burden on your employees come January 1 if we are, if President Trump's campaign promise not to to forgive this, it, it doesn't end up coming through. Um, it leaves it leaves uh, employees holding employees and employers holding the bag with what what to do and how to end up collecting on that, um, and how to collect on that if an employee leaves, right? So if a if an employee leaves halfway through the deferral period. How do you then collect um, on that, uh, those deferred taxes when they're due? There isn't guidance on that. They said that potentially um, they would implement other mechanisms, but I mean, are we going to go through collections lawsuits um, to collect on these taxes? I, I don't know the answer to that. So these are just some of the things that we're thinking about, some of the things that our challenges that are coming up with our clients and and rightfully so. Um, that said, I think that there's potentially a situation where this gets forgiven at the end of, uh, of the period, right? So then are your employees at a dis disadvantage? Uh, if it is, it, they could have had, let's say three grand or so back in their pocket. Again, not something we know, but um, I think it's important right now for employee messaging. If your employees are talking about this, if your employees are, are if it's on their minds, and as an employer, you choose not to um, opt into this program, I think it might make sense to communicate and be transparent with your employees and say, look, this is a, a, a potentially great program but we feel it is not in your best interest. Um, and, and, you know, Bodman has, has drafted some, some communications for clients to that effect um, where, where we're just outlining, hey, this is, the, this is as much for you as it is for us, right? Um, and, and, and it doesn't make sense for you to then double withhold for a four month period following this deferral. So just some things to think about and that's sort of, I guess my high level overview of, of the program and um, general impression, it's gonna be different for every employer. It's gonna be different if you want to implement it or not, um, but that's just my general overview, so. For sure, yeah, Michelle, thank you. For, I mean, what a thorough analysis. I think if there's one thing, 2020 has taught us many things, but there's one, one theme of 2020 is that certainty has certainly not been paramount. For sure. I saw and that through, with the CARES Act too, right? Um, you know, right. it was new guidance issued every day. So, you know, it, it's a it's very much take it as it comes and, and we're just trying to roll with it. Well, that, I mean, all the information, I mean, is providing businesses, you know, who, who struggle with certainty, even under normal circumstances. Right. Um, challenge. Now it seems like, I mean, the, the not so simple question with all of this is to defer or not to defer. And then and there's piling on to that several other questions um, with all the other implications. Ultimately, it sounds like the tax bill, at least for now, from a legal perspective, is ultimately due at some point while it would be deferred. So uh, what is the, is there a consensus for you hearing? I know there's some national companies have weighed in, some states have opted out of doing this too. Um, 
this sounds to me is that the consensus that businesses are deferring or not deferring right now it sounds like they are not deferring yeah so so i think i i sort of intimate intimated at that and 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 intimated that that's some somewhat of the advice that i'm providing to my clients right um i think it's going to be a huge administrative burden um to try to go ahead and implement this and then later on figure out what it looks like to collect on it what it looks like to collect on it from people that are no longer with the company um and just quite frankly the people that really need this the people that are are that it would be truly helpful for them to get 6.2 percent back in their paycheck are not going to be the same people that are able to double withhold it in in the after the deferral period's over um you know one of the things that i i, I have cautioned um clients about is employees may feel like this is unfair um i want to to defer my taxes I, that's what i want there's no guidance requiring employers to do this um and if there's no guidance requiring them to take a piecemeal approach either. So if an employer says, I'm going to defer, go ahead and do it uh, for all of your employees. If you're not going to, you can go ahead and do it for, for none of your employees. Um, but I would say that there is a potential for some kind of, and I, I don't know what this looks like, but there is some potential for at the end of this, let's say President Trump is reelected and says, you know, this I'm going to make good on my my campaign promise and I'm going to have Congress uh, go through this this um, um, action to completely forgive it. People are going to be mad. Um, I don't know how that ends up looking, but I will say this. There's strength in numbers. Um, I, I just mentioned some of the big players that are, are not going to be doing this. And quite frankly, I, I, I don't know that I've run into anyone that is doing it. Um, so that will be worked out. And I, I, I can't see a situation where an employer is going to face any significant liability for not implementing this. So that's sort of my overarching advice. Um, and again, it's a it's a business decision. It's it's your business's decision. And to the extent that you would like to implement it, I think that that that's great. And there are tools to to make that happen. Um, it it will be burdensome, and that will work itself out, I guess. For sure. I mean, the I mean, the burdens on on either side. I mean, are are many. And you know, should the deferral stick? Um, at least on, on legal footing. I know, I mean, Congress, I think, has the ability to review this through the Congressional Review Act. So, I mean, that's something different. I think there were letters sent this week in D.C. Uh, me being a political and policy junkie, I tend to see things through those eyes. But these are important business decisions, <laughs> important decisions for people's pocketbooks. So if people, you know, were to be able to choose the deferral, um, if we're talking about who's eligible, I mean, it would have a hit to you know where those dollars go in the social security trust fund but who would be i guess maybe on a basic level who would be eligible for this so what? the in, the individuals that are eligible make less than one hundred and four thousand dollars annually um on a bi-weekly basis less than four thousand dollars annually and why why those numbers come into play um in separately is because of of kind of what I mentioned. You may have an employee who is hourly and works um, a ton of overtime one one week, and then is therefore not eligible in in a pay period. And so it will be, and again, adding to sort of that administrative burden and that tracking. You an employee who was eligible last pay pay period may not be eligible because they've gone over that four thousand dollar threshold so those are the individuals that are eligible um and um as far as guidance beyond that it, that's what we have that's what we know the, the never never ending questions and 
can't thank you enough for providing, I mean, such a thorough analysis. I know, I think we have some questions coming in from folks on the line. Um, sure. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it to Megan for those questions to continue this conversation. Thanks, Matt. Hi, Michelle. Um, you mentioned that employers that are interested in implementing it, this, that there would be tools available to them. Can you tell us what those tools are or where people can find them? <clears throat> so uh, I'm not I'm not sure that I I meant that there were um, you know in process tools available. What I meant was later on when the um, when the deferral period is over and it becomes collection time, the IRS has has intimated that there will be mechanisms available to employers to collect on those obligations. They've not they've not stated what those are or provided much clarity around uh, around how they expect employers to um, to collect on those obligations, but the the guidance says that there will be mechanisms. Um, that's that's really what I was I was uh, referencing with that. Understood. And so, is it your opinion at this point that it will be the employer that is liable for reimbursing the deferral, and that it's not going to be the employees necessarily? especially if they depart like talk a little bit more about that and who's liable to pay it back sure and 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 that's one of the things um so the presidential mem memorandum came out and everyone was left with questions of who's responsible for this at the end of the day the notice clarified that it is the employer um the the notice refers to the taxpayer as the employer so meaning that the employer is the one who has the choice to opt in or out of this. And at the end of the day, the employer is the taxpayer responsible for these taxes. The way it works in, you know, in a, in a very technical sense is that once an employer uh, withholds, they immediately have a duty to then pay. Um, this defers their um, obligation to withhold and thereby defers their obligation to then pay it in. So that's kind of how it works in, in, a, in a technical sense. The employer will have an obligation to then pay that back at the uh, come January 1. They, the time period in which they pay it back is uh, the first of the year through April 30th. Um, so does that answer your question? I think so. So if an employee departs prior oh. to the January 1st timing, um, what would your suggestion be? Could an employer say, like, withhold the withholdings from their final paycheck? Would that be a solution so that they don't get stuck footing the bill? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, what I would say, if we're, if we're going, as an employer, we're going to implement this, what I would do is I would for all of the employees that you have that are participating and want to participate in this, I would execute some type of a, a simple agreement or attestation stating that they agree to this, that this is what they want, that they understand that the expectation is for it at this moment to be paid back. Um, and upon departure, um, we will withhold from your final paycheck. Um, I, I think that that's something that that can be easily done with your counsel, um, and and I think that it it also provides that that certainty for employers of what's going to happen. That said, um, you may end up in uh, in a collection situation. Um, you may end up being if, for example, the employers the employer leaves and there's only, you know, I mean, there's only so much to withhold out of that final paycheck, right? So you can still be left with an outstanding amount. And whether or not, um, 
as a business decision, you decide to hire an attorney or a collections firm to sort of go after that um, that employee it is is it remains to be seen at this point. Um, again, going going back to the mechanisms that that they are are purportedly going to implement for this. Um, I'm hoping to see something short of a of a collections action for employers that seems that seems significantly burdensome for an employer to be responsible. I mean, if you think about someone that has an employer that has 700 employees or a thousand employees or what have you, to to institute collections actions for a bunch of your employees would be borderline unfeasible. So, I think implementing early on um, an agreement where, um, and I haven't admittedly drafted anything like this yet. I, I think with a little bit of, of consideration, we could put together something that would protect the employer as much as possible um, and at least retain as much from their, their final paycheck as legally um, available um, to, to kind of combat this the situation if an employee leaves now um to be clear an employer is all in or all out the employee does not get to make a decision if if the, for example the chamber chose to do this all employees that qualified would automatically be deferring or it, can the individual make a decision if they based on the employer's decision like could an individual say no i don't want to participate in this so the guidance is is silent on that point, um, but I would say that the uh, employer is responsible for that decision. If, as you said in your example, the chamber wanted to issue this and I wanted to opt out, I it, it is up to the chamber to make that decision. For example, um, the federal um, government is implementing this and they have determined that employees are unable to opt out. So that's an example. Again, it goes back to my, my earlier statement that the employer is the taxpayer here. So what the employer decides to do with his, his or her, its obligations um, is, is uh, primary. And so therefore, if the employer chooses to opt out, an employee is unable to opt in. Correct. Correct. Okay, Matt, right. that, that pretty much covers our attendee questions so far. Sure. Let's Thanks, Megan. I guess maybe one other question too, and just about to jump in. So it, so it sounds a bit like um, thinking of a worst case scenario. Um, obviously, we're still dealing with COVID nineteen, and hopefully, things uh, improve. Goes without saying. Um, but if if the economy takes a turn for the worse and we're looking at the end of the year and let's say that an employer had chosen to defer and that employee is then for whatever reason forced to be laid off um those taxes would still be due and you're looking at a situation with potential would you be looking at potential situation with employee could be then laid off and owing taxes um while unemployed going into 2021 sure um Again, I think it's it's the employer's obligation at the end of the day, right? Um, and how they how they decide to collect on those those taxes is going to to be up to the employer. But yes, I mean, to your point, it, it the the employer isn't going to just hold the bag for everybody's taxes, right? So if there's right. a layoff situation, and and yes, you're absolutely right. Interesting. Well, um, getting through the end of our time, I know everyone's time is important, especially in busy days like these, especially yours, Michelle, and, and Megan too, but um, I want to turn it back to you for some closing comments, Michelle, uh, before we wrap up. Well, yeah, I just want to say thank you again um, for you guys having me. Uh, I know this is a sort of outstanding issue and, and um you know, to the extent that anyone has additional questions, I'm, I'm sure that my contact information is, is somewhere around here. And I think also, if people want to implement this program, 
by all means. I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to come down on the program. I'm I'm just reiterating the administrative burdens of it. Um, I think it is important to message it to your employees and be transparent with your employees, um, regardless of what you do. Um, and and again, we're happy to help with with if you decide to implement it. I I think that we can absolutely draft some kind of a in a an agreement or an attestation that outlines the employee's obligations to the employer over this. Um, and if you decide not to implement it and you believe that this is on your employees' minds and that a communication to be transparent with your employees is necessary, you know, we've we've drafted those uh, for multiple clients as well. So happy to happy to help anyone that that has additional questions or or, or needs anything further on on this um, kind of outstanding topic. Sure. Well, thanks for that offer. Um, I know I for one will probably most certainly take you up on it. Um, I hope we've, it sounds like from our audience, we've got, we got some really great, smart questions today. I know I learned a lot. I hope everyone else did. Um, so can't thank you enough, Michelle. I mean, not only for joining us today, in the middle of what's I'm sure a busy day, um, but also, I mean, everything you're doing to help businesses navigate this really unprecedented and challenging year with an unending list of questions. So hopefully everyone got some answers today. and. If not, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you to our listeners. Uh, Megan, thank you. And everyone, please stay safe. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.